Hello, my name is Adam Faskowitz and I'm a data scientist here at Tipco Software. Images of defects and failure patterns can contain important clues as to the source of potential problems in a manufacturing process. Though today we'll focus on semiconductor wafers, it can be said for many verticals that if patterns are understood, they can be predicted, monitored, and acted upon. The challenge, however, is how to sift through terabytes of sensor and image data to label or identify these patterns of interest. Today I'll demonstrate how to find a needle in a haystack. I'll do this by quickly and accurately identifying patterns of interest on semiconductor wafers. From there, we'll see how anybody, from an experienced process engineer to a non-expert, can train accurate machine learning models to automatically identify these patterns in a simple interactive control panel. Next, once our models are trained, we can either perform batch scoring on new data or deploy our models to the edge and score streaming data to track and monitor our patterns in real time. Finally, I'll explain how we're using a combination of advanced machine learning techniques hidden behind our simple, intuitive data visualization platform, Spotfire, to achieve our results. We begin by looking at a Spotfire dashboard that contains the last batch of wafers that came off the fab floor. If unfamiliar, you can imagine a wafer as a disk comparable physically to a vinyl record. The raw data here is represented by a circular map of test measurements for each integrated circuit chip spanning the wafer. The wafers contain 733 dye with each chip on the wafer undergoing a battery of tests to determine its quality and viability. Let's take a quick view at what we're looking at here in our dashboard. So on this first page here on the left, you have the cluster level view of what's going on. So initially through our data pipeline, we have these pre-generated clusters, which you can think of as groups of similar looking wafers through their composite wafer maps. These maps represent the average value across all wafers in a certain cluster. You can see that some of the groups kind of look like a distinct pattern and others might not look like much. This process that you want to start is you want to go to the top left, select the composite wafer map, which in doing so will drill down to the specific wafers in that cluster on the bottom left. In this case, it resembles something like a heart and if you think that this is a relevant pattern, then you're gonna to go to the top panel, type in heart, click add to new pattern, and now your heart pattern that you just created is now part of all the user specified patterns on the top right. So once you're on the right side, you're dealing with the patterns that you've created, and here you can select them, view everything, all the specific wafers in a pattern here on the bottom right. Then you can go to the left to just add more things to certain patterns that you're interested in. So I'll go over to another cluster here uh, since it looks similar in the composite preview. And here you can see that these also look like hearts. So what we'll do is select them all, add wafers to existing pattern here in the middle panel. I'll select heart, uh, click add to existing pattern. And now I have 51 hearts in the heart pattern. So going through and doing this for all of these patterns, we can kind of create a dictionary of the things that we want to monitor in the future. Once we've done this, I'll move on to the next page where I'm going to create the models for the patterns that I just generated. We're going to create models that will identify the pattern that we were looking for and automatically be able to classify that pattern in new data. So here on this page on the top left is where most of the magic is happening. You want to select the target pattern that you want to model on. I will click on the heart pattern. Here on the left, you can see all the wafers that we put into the heart pattern from the previous page. Now we want to train a model to be able to hopefully identify the heart pattern in all of our data. I'm running this model on a lower classification threshold, and the reason why is because I actually don't mind false positives in this case, because I want to see which wafers the model thinks are hearts, because I want to have a dictionary of every single heart so I can have the best model. So what I want to actually do is to see what I got wrong and then add it to my target pattern. Here you can see that there are some hearts here. There are 17 false positives, which is indicated by the confusion matrix on the top right. The confusion matrix is a good way for you to understand the results of your model. If you click in the bottom right here, these are true positives. Wafers I labeled as correct and wafers that the model identified as correct. If I were to click on the bottom left, these are wafers that the models felt were correct but were not indicated so in the data set. These are known as false positives. If we go back to our dashboard, 
there's some hearts here, so I'll go and select them. So everything that looks like a heart, I can go in and select. You can see that some don't, and that's fine. Since we set a low threshold, our goal at this stage is to make our model better by adding things to the training set. This is an iterative step in the process where we're trying to improve the model, but not expecting this to be our final version. I've done this, now I have 61 heart patterns labeled, so I've added 10 new wafers. Now I'll just run this again, and this is where the beauty of the process really begins to shine through. Now you can see that our accuracy is way up from before. In reference to the metrics, accuracy is a really good baseline for you to evaluate your model. F1 score and ROC AUC are more advanced metrics that give you a weighted accuracy based on things like false positives and false negatives. Looking at the results, there are only a couple of things that are misclassified, and these actually both don't look like hearts, so it shows that even with a very low threshold, the things that the random forests are classifying as a heart is now much more accurate. Once I'm satisfied with everything here, I'm going to put the classification threshold back up to 0.5, run the model again, and doing this is basically saying I'm finalizing my model, I'm happy with all the hearts that I have here on the left, and I want to run that specific model with a normal threshold at 0.5. So I'm satisfied with this. I'll go ahead and hit export model and now I'll have a few options for running my models on new data. One of the ways I can run my model is I can run it in Spotfire on data that I upload. So here on the bottom is some of the data that I've uploaded. I'll click run model on new data and doing this I can see the results. Specifically, looking at the top three panels, you can see the counts for each specific pattern in your new data. We can click on it and it will now filter to everything that was classified as such. These are the Pac-Man patterns that we labeled, but it will also show you the lot trend per pattern showing how the patterns evolved across many lots, which can be useful when you have a lot more lots to deal with. Another case is to take the models and deploy them in an event stream and score incoming wafers in real time. Utilizing TIBCO streaming, TIBCO's streaming platform, we're able to take the raw wafer data being streamed into our Spotfire dashboard in real time. We've deployed an ensemble model that we created through the very same iterative workflow that we just went through, and that model allows us to determine which pattern these new incoming wafers belong to. So instead of manually going through and looking at which patterns might be interesting, we've set up a system that automatically monitors and tracks these patterns of interest in real time. So here on the stream page, we can take a look at what it means when we say real time scoring. Here on the top left, you can see that we're modeling on five different patterns. And we can see the wafer count of each of these patterns. So all of these models are deployed in TIBCO streaming, which allows us to score on all the wafers. You're slowly going to start seeing that these numbers are evolving over time because patterns are being classified and wafers are assigned to a certain group. The numbers in each group change over time, as well as the composite wafer maps in the center as new wafers are streamed through. The same can also be said for the lot trend chart on the top right. This is a very interactive dashboard, so if we're going to click on anything here, like background, it will show you everything for each composite wafer map and filter to those specific wafers on the bottom chart. Additionally, we might begin to see a new pattern emerge from this new batch, and if we wanted to add that pattern, we would simply go back to where we started by defining it as a pattern and iteratively training a model to recognize it. From there, we'd add this model to the ensemble, and it would begin to track it just like the other patterns we see here. In reference to this cycle, it's actually a fairly simple workflow, but there is quite a sophisticated system behind it. I've mentioned this pipeline a few times, perhaps it's time to take a quick look at what I was talking about. The core components include statistical methods such as Fourier bezel transformation, singular value decomposition, and then a type of neural network known as a self-organizing map to get us to our final clusterings. Similar to a Fourier transform, using bezel decompositions, we're able to express the original measurements of a wafer or disk into a series of coefficients that correspond to mathematical functions. Therefore, a wafer can be described as a linear combination of these coefficients and basis functions. Transforming the wafers this way offers many advantages, some being the speed of calculation, dimensionality reduction, reducing 733 dice measurements, 
to a vector of around 100 coefficients. Also, missing data does not affect the decomposition. The resulting set of coefficients themselves are guaranteed to be complete with no missing values, which is key for the next step of singular value decomposition. We further reduce our data set from 100 coefficients to around 10 modes of variation seen in the spatial pattern of the wafer maps. Since the bezel coefficients corresponded to specific spatial patterns, our informational integrity is still intact. This complex data pipeline running in the background enables us to use a simple workflow where patterns in these wafers are easy to find and label, then subsequently train an accurate model to identify them, all within Spotfire. Stepping back, what we've done is created dashboards that allow end users to interact with advanced statistics and machine learning models to get real-time insights on day-to-day -day operations and critical problems. What's great is that users don't have to be data scientists. We've used TIBCO's visualization capabilities on top of its advanced analytics functions to provide an easy-to-use business layer over some pretty complex math. We've also simplified model building so that models are easy to adjust and keep current. Finally, we've created a process to monitor trends by deploying our models on streaming data in real time. This combination of models plus business applications plus streaming data can be applied to almost any business scenario where it's important to make predictions or understand root causes in real time.